So welcome to another episode of Behind the Telescope where we find out a little bit more about one of the astronomers here at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich. And today in the hot seat is our very own Greg Brown, one of the public astronomy officers here at the observatory. So good afternoon, Greg. <laughs> good afternoon, Emma. All right, let's jump straight in and talk about astronomy. So how did you get into astronomy? Is it something that you enjoyed as a kid? Tell us all about that. So, I do not know when I got interested in astronomy. All I know is that when I was seven years old, um, my teacher at the time asked the class to each produce their own short talk that they present to the rest of the class, a couple of minutes long, nothing long at all, on whatever topic they wanted to talk about, anything they wanted. Um, and I chose astronomy. So clearly I was already interested in space by that time, so by seven years old. Um, I put together a whistle-stop tour of our solar system, so we flew past all of our planets. It was like a, um, a very brief and slightly broken version of one of our virtual planetarium shows that we're running at the moment. <laughs> Um, and then I took us beyond our solar system, this was supposed to fit in about two or three minutes by the way, it didn't, uh, took us beyond our solar system and looked at the rest of our galaxy and the supermassive black hole in the centre of our galaxy. So I'd already heard about this really weird, cool thing, um, and I'd even heard of the topic of uh, time dilation. What, what did seven-year-old Greg think about time dilation? Did he explain that to the class? Uh, he completely and utterly misunderstood the way that black holes work. I had this very, very strange idea that first, the supermassive black hole in the centre of our galaxy could swallow the entirety of the rest of the galaxy. It can't. Um, and that because time slows down as you get closer and closer, um, but time for the rest of the universe continues normally, that we could have fallen into it but because our time is going slower, we haven't realised that yet. So it hasn't happened to us yet, but it has happened. But it, we don't know. And it, it was just completely messed up. I, I had no idea what I was talking about, but it didn't matter. Because I was clearly hooked on the topic. I absolutely loved it. And as it turned out, black holes have been a, um, a fascination of mine since then. So two, two, two and a half decades. Um, <laughs> Well, that's a brilliant start. So clearly, from a young age, interested in space, black holes. So what were the next steps? Was it then to become an astronomer? What did you have to yeah. do? Yeah. So I basically had it in my head from that point forward that I was going to be an astronomer. I was going to be doing something to do with space. I was going to be finding out more about space. I was going to be, uh, I don't know, the next Stephen Hawking or something along those lines. It's a big ambition to did seven-year-old Greg. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I wanted to be um, a, a researcher, not that I really knew what a researcher was. Then um, I got to my A-levels, and that's where you really, of course, have this choice to make about what you want to do. Um, and so I went uh, full hardcore with my, uh, with my A-levels in order to, to maximize my chances. So um, physics, obviously, uh, maths, Obviously, further maths, because apparently maths isn't enough, um, and uh, chemistry were the A-levels that I took. Um, but I had the opportunity to take uh, an additional one just for one year, an AS, um, such as theatre studies. Um, <laughs> That's slightly different to the other four there. It is a bit like past it. And what made you that was basically the reason that the others were all going to be very, very heavy topics. And that's not to say that theatre studies were going to be an easy one. It's just one that I didn't need to do well in in order to further my career. So um, I put all the effort I could into it. But if it turned out that I was absolutely rubbish at analysing theatre, it didn't matter. Um, I, I'd done a lot of... Um, of theatre and some, some musical theatre as well uh, in my secondary school. I really enjoyed it, I really loved it, despite the fact that I was absolutely terrified of any public performance whatsoever. I would, uh, when I was much younger, I was in sort of year seven, so I was about 11 years old, I would be um, deliberately volunteering to do the readings in assembly, even though they terrified me 
because they terrified me, because I knew that I was a terrible public speaker. Um, and whereas at, at so many other people would sort of be like, oh yes, just sort of standing behind the lectern, and, oh yes, just stalling all of these uh, readings. I'd be there clamped on with white knuckles the entire time, just get, hoping uh, that I didn't mess up something along the way. And of course, inevitably, I would, because you do speak every now and then. And there would be this sort of five or ten second pause where I'd sort of be able to control the rising panic in myself. And then there'd be sort of this shudder that went through me as I couldn't hold it back any further. I'm very much hoping that, that no one in front of me noticed, but I'm almost certain that the, the, the head boy and girl sat behind me wouldn't have noticed this sort of shivering leaf of a character in front of them. We've gotten to your A-levels. We've taken four very difficult A-levels, just the light-hearted theatre studies. <laughs> so is it next into university? Yes, so um, I uh, applied for a handful of different universities. One thing I do not recommend doing, by the way, and I've done it repeatedly throughout my life and somehow got away with it. Um, if you are given the option to apply to five, six, seven universities, do so. Don't do what I did, which is where I applied to three, one of which is Oxford, <laughs> leaving myself in just these two other ones. I don't know why I thought it was a good idea. I didn't think it was a good idea, but... Self-belief is very important. <laughs> <laughs> Arrogance, I think, is probably closer to the, 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 uh, closer to the mark there. But yeah, so I applied to a couple of other universities. Uh, one which is the, the University of Kent um, in uh, Canterbury. The other one was Leicester. And I did manage to go there. I applied for um, a full four-year master's. So in your undergrad, You've mentioned when you were younger that you were interested in black holes. Was there a particular module during your degree that made you think, oh, I'm still heading towards black holes? So, no, actually. So, uh, I say that I was interested in black holes throughout, and that's definitely true. Um, but I must admit, during my undergrad, almost all mention of black holes just sort of disappeared. It was just this sort of tiny little thing at the very end of. Um, uh, um, the, the star formation and evolution course. That was it. That was basically always in there. And uh, it was... I, I sort of changed tack. I started going into um, so-called transient events. So a transient event is one which is short-lived or changing. Um, and mostly I was looking at what are called extragalactic transient events. So these are things which happen outside of our galaxy. If they're outside of our galaxy, then they have to be very, very bright in order for you to see them. And if they're short, then, well, short, bright things, it's explosions. Big bangs in other parts of space is basically what I ended up uh, finding an interest in. And so I got hooked on the topic of um, gamma ray bursts, these extraordinarily powerful explosions like supernovae plus. So when it came to going on to do a PhD, your, the topic of your PhD honestly doesn't matter all that much for what you want your research to be or anything else you want to be in the future. So I had this vast array of different choices in front of me. Oh, I could go down the planetary route and do some exoplanets or maybe do something in the solar system, maybe I'll do something along those lines. Star formation, this, that and the other. And I'm like, ooh, big bangs! Yeah, I'll go with that one. Um, so I ended up applying for all sorts of different uh, PhDs with <laughs> explosions in the name. <laughs> and which one of those explosions did you pick in the end? Um, well, I did the same thing again um, as I did when I applied for my university in the first place, in that I only applied for three PhDs, which was a really stupid move, but again, it paid off. So I applied to the University of, Le of Leicester, the one where I did my undergrad, for something on the topic of GRBs. I applied to the University of Edinburgh um, for uh, a modelling one of, uh, again, GRBs or explosions, um, where I would, I would have been working in Fortran, uh, which is uh, basically in the 1980s, something along those lines, computer programming code. 70s, Darren. 70s, is yeah, it? Yeah, it's been um, and yeah, well that would have been an experience, um, uh, as, as I'm sure it was for you. Um, but it turned out that they didn't have any funding, so they said, sure you can come, you'll have to fund yourself. And I went, no, okay, <laughs> that's not happening. 
Um, so I then went, uh, I then also applied to the University of Warwick. And I again applied for a PhD on these gamma ray bursts because it seemed like a really interesting topic. And then about a month after I started, my supervisor uh, came to me and said, um, So, you know, you applied for uh, the topic of GRBs, these gamma ray bursts. And I said, No. Well, there's this weird thing that went off about six months before you arrived. It appears to be an entirely new class of event. We've never come across it before. Would you like to do that? Wait. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, please. Uh, so very few people uh, in the world were working on this sort of event at the time. Um, and it was called a tidal disruption flare. So this is uh, a star literally being torn apart by a supermassive black hole in a distant part of the universe, often a different galaxy. And I was back on black holes again! And I, so somehow I ended up in uh, completely doing a, a, a 180 and, and ended up doing black holes. Although GLBs often end in black holes as well. But uh, <laughs> yeah, the, uh, I ended up doing um, supermassive black holes now. Not just, not just those piddly stellar mass ones, no, no. The big ones. So I didn't go in with any misconceptions about what was going to happen. I knew that I was going to be chipping away at this mountain of knowledge, and I was maybe, if I get lucky, a pebble would fall off. And I, that was fine, I was happy with that. Um, but even so, it was undeniably, it was tough. And the realisation that this was basically, this was what the next 40 years of my life were going to be like if I continued along that route. Not to say that that would be necessarily a bad thing, but was it necessarily the thing I wanted to do at that time? And so on that point, of course, you were doing the research, but you were also involved in some other things. Yes. I started off working in and then eventually took over the running of um, a mobile planetarium. So uh, basically a big tent with a blower that you put inside and it inflates the whole thing up to fill a, a huge, pretty sizable classroom. Um, and then you <laughs> get as many people stuffed inside of it as you can, stick a projector on and display stuff up on the, the, the roof. I also just heard, I did a Christmas lecture as part of it, um, which went okay. Um, I decided to do it on gravitational waves because it had been about one year since, the, almost exactly one year actually, since the discovery of the first, the first detection of gravitational waves in 2015. So I thought, perfect, lovely, I'll do this. Um, and uh, we were trying to think of interesting ways to make it, sort of make it lively and make it understandable to seven-year-olds. And so there I was, uh, in the week leading up to Christmas, um, in a suit which admittedly was a bit too small for me. I probably should have checked before I uh, went on stage, but never mind. Um, with two eminent professors in their domain, one in exoplanets and the other in white dwarfs, um, and two of my colleagues as well, PhD students. All of us wearing tutus, um, uh, providing an explanation of how gravitational waves distort space-time through the medium of interpretive dance. Um, I think the, the thing that really sort of the cherry on top was um, my choice of music, uh, The Sugar Plum Fairy. And so I was like, oh, come on, come on, how can you not? Um, it was, it has to be one of the most surreal things I've done. <laughs> Dances on gravitational waves. <laughs> you would be surprised. <laughs> and maybe one day the Royal Observatory will be graced by my incredible ballet prowess um, and they will see it again. Maybe, we'll see. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, I, basically, all of that stuff, I absolutely loved it the idea of putting together these things and, uh, and coming up with new ways of explaining science. So at this point presenting has become part of your life and yeah. it's something that you wanted to continue mm -hmm. to do, so how then did you end up with us at the observatory? And then a post came up at the Royal Observatory Greenwich, um, 
for a, uh, oh, what was I back then? Astronomy Education Officer. Um, and I've got, well, I've got lots of experience in all the things they're looking for. I've even got experience in the planetarium, so I don't know, let's give it a go and see what happens. Um, and I got it. And I started in oh, October 2017, so three and a half years ago now. Um, and yeah, <laughs> it's been it's been great. <laughs> uh, but so you are not a astronomy education officer no. anymore. You are now a public astronomy no. officer. Yeah. So what led you to take up that position instead? So, as much as I enjoy presenting to younger audiences, to students, and I, I do, uh, it, it, you, some of my best audiences have been um, sort of in the 7 to 14 range, something along those lines. I do have, you know, a PhD, and it would be nice to use some of the, the sort of more complicated science and sort of, sort of uh, not always be talking about the sun, the earth and the moon and that sort of thing. Um, and I thought my best chance for doing as much sort of sort of higher level stuff, talking to adult audiences, occasionally even talking to expert audiences, it doesn't happen very often, but sometimes it does, would be to go to the public team. And not just that, uh, they also have, they do more variety, there's more um, room for you to, to to put your own mark on things than there is sometimes in the education team. It depends on exactly what they're working on, but in the education team, you are always bound to a curriculum. When it comes down to it, the teaching points are always going to be the same. It's how you can get those teaching points in the changes. Whereas in the public team, do you want to talk about black holes? Sure. Do you want to talk about super? Yeah. Do you want to talk about uh, uh, exoplanets? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, do you want to talk about this completely new discovery that was made last week? Yes! Don't have much room to do that in the education team, but in the public team, plenty. And they have more fun, um, as you've already mentioned. So, yeah, absolutely. So, the, uh, it, it was really obvious uh, when uh, my predecessor for this role left that uh, I should absolutely apply, and I did, and I got it, and I'm here. Um, and Seems to be going okay so far. So yeah, Pretty good, I think. Yeah, good. I'm glad to hear it. That's that's nice to hear. Uh, so you say, of course, the public team has more variety in their content, but then what does this mean that you do on a daily or perhaps a weekly basis? What kinds of things yeah. do you do in your role? Um, so it very much depends. So the the public astronomy team in general are supposed to um, look over, manage, and then uh, often run the public offer. So that would be anything that is not directly connected to education basically goes through us. Um, with, the, with the exception of planetarium shows themselves, which are run by the planetarium team. So I might be doing the day-to-day -day of sort of checking that the website is up and running, checking that all of the tickets are ready to go, seeing what the numbers are, and seeing if we need to advertise in a different way. I partially run the, the um, our social media channels and our YouTube channel along with other members of the team, so I will be constantly checking those, making certain that everything's running on those. Or I could be coming up with an entirely new talk that I've never done before uh, on a topic which I've never really discussed before, and so I'm doing entirely new research on the topic I've never seen before or never done a huge amount on, um, for all sorts of different purposes. So it, it really is very varied, constantly changing all the time. So on top of the communication that you're doing, do you get to do some astronomy as well now here at the observatory? Because we do have two quite interesting mm -hmm. telescopes. We do indeed. So. Uh, Myself and yourself, Hannah, uh, we run the Great Equatorial Telescope and the Annie Maunder Astrographic Telescope, which is our modern day um, sort of uh, brought into the 21st century. It's smaller than this, um, but its capabilities are in some ways better because, well, it's not 130 years old, so that helps. Um, and, uh, and there are all sorts of other sort of 
bells and whistles attached to it. And yeah, so we, we uh, try to make use of those telescopes as much as we can. Um, bearing in mind that the weather is appalling um, and uh, <laughs> sometimes the equipment doesn't work um, but when we do we get the chance to take as many images and, uh, and even start to consider the possibility of trying to do some actual science with the telescopes as well. That may still be a way off yet but even so it's tantalisingly close. Lastly, we've spoken about your journey to becoming an astronomer. What advice would you give to anyone who maybe wants to get into astronomy, worries that perhaps they couldn't, what would you say? So, what I would say is that as long as you have passion and drive, motivation, and are willing to put in the hours, absolutely anyone could work in astronomy. Anyone. You aren't going to be the next Stephen Hawking. <laughs> but you could become a researcher in astronomy. There's absolutely no reason why not. Uh, you could become a science communicator like us. You could uh, work in one of the um, array of different groups that are, are working across the world to do space exploration, NASA, ESA. Um, uh, you could join SpaceX and try to get involved in uh, commercial ventures to, to do the same sort of thing. Uh, there are so many different paths that you could take. One piece of advice I would probably give, and it's, it's been given before by another one of uh, our astronomers, maybe by one or two of them, um, but I think it's really worth mentioning, is that I had always assumed I was going to be an astronomy researcher, I was going to be learning entirely new things that no one had known before about space for basically the whole of my life until I retired or more likely didn't retire and just kept on going because that's basically what I expected to happen. Um, but it didn't. And for a while I felt as though somehow I'd failed as though I hadn't lived up to the potential that I had and it took a while for me to realize that what had actually happened was I hadn't not lived up to my potential I just discovered that it was somewhere else and I don't just enjoy presenting I think I hope I'm good at it <laughs> and uh, <laughs> That's basically, I, I, it's much, much better to have that um, fulfillment of, of realising that you've done something not just to the best of your ability, but also to have done it well. And that's really, that's really nice to be able to do. So I, I just realised that I'm, I may not be a researcher now. I was a researcher for four or five years. And I might be a researcher sometime in the future, but that doesn't mean that doing this now is a failure, far from it. It's uh, a success because I'm really enjoying myself and I am still learning things about space. It might not be things that no one else in the world knows, but those moments are fleeting anyway, even for, for researchers. So why not just enjoy it? Perfect. Thank you very much, Greg. Thank you.